A few years ago, a leading Colgate executive and his team had developed a new best-in-class fluoride that they were meshing into their toothpaste. They had spent months and months developing this fluoride, and they knew that it would be a breakthrough on the market. But there was a mechanical flow problem, and the fluoride was getting stuck in the equipment. It wasn't meshing met well, and all the chemists internally were trying to figure out why. So after months and months of the best chemists inside Colgate trying to figure it out, no one could solve this problem. At that point, the executive decided that they needed to ask a different question. They needed to ask who else could help us outside of our go-to experts, who else could help us solve this problem? So they posted the fluoride challenge on a website called Innocentive. Innocentive is an online community where scientists around the world come together to help large companies, including many pharmaceutical life sciences companies that are in this room, solve scientific challenges. And within just two days of posting the challenge on the website, a physicist named Ed Melkrick, posted up, shared up here, who lives in Canada, looked at the problem and he said, this isn't a chemistry problem. It's a physics problem. It's about charged particles. He charged the fluoride one way, the toothpaste the other. Instantly, the problem was solved. Colgate learned a few things from this story. The first thing they learned is that they didn't even dare to ask the physicists at their own company because they thought of it as a chemistry problem. The second thing they realized is that the physicists that solved the problem would have never been hired by Colgate. He had had odd jobs throughout his life and didn't have the traditional resume. So they realized that by using their networks differently, they could access and engage expertise far outside their own. So the first question I want you all to think about today is, how do you keep learning from networks outside of your own, from networks outside of your usual go-to suspects? And how do you design your questions differently so that they're not just going to those usual experts, but they're designed in a way where others, you may, people that you may not know, could help you solve that problem. This is Jeannie Peeper. When Jeannie Peeper was four years old, she was diagnosed with a very rare disease called FOB. To give you a sense, there were only two research papers in the entire 20th century on this disease. And she spent 20 years in her youth scouring from doctor to doctor on how to better diagnose and treat her illness. It was in her early 20s that she met one doctor named Dr. Michael Zaslov, who had seen 18 patients over his lifetime that had this disease and developed an interest in it, something that she didn't find from any other doctor she had met. And when Jeannie learned about this, she asked a different question. She asked, what if I connected all of these patients that had gone through the same challenges as me for so long? So she started one by one, handwriting letters to every patient that she could connect to. Then she created an email community, which was for the first time ever, these patients coming together. Then it was a Facebook group. Today, it is a real-time knowledge network where patients with FOB around the world, everywhere from Saudi Arabia to St. Louis to San Francisco, are sharing expertise, are sharing symptoms, issues, um, relief, preventative mechanisms, and one of the best things is that now doctors are going to this real-time knowledge community that was created and led by patients to learn how to better diagnose and treat FOB. Uh, so not only has it become a support group for patients, but it turned into a real-time expertise network. Not only does the story stop there, actually today, the first ever medical research has now been funded out of this connected network at the University of Pennsylvania. And Jeannie Peeper's rare disease community has become a model for rare disease patient communities around the world. So the second question I want all of you to think about is how do you leverage your current existing networks? While they may be used to solve one problem, which is why they came together, what other problems could they solve? When Jeannie connected this network, she started it for emotional support and connection but it was able to turn into a systematic way to help patients, researchers, doctors, and universities to come together around this illness. 
The third story I want to share is about Duolingo. Who here has used Duolingo? Raise your hand if you have it. All right, a lot of Duol Duolingo users. Uh, Duolingo is a free language learning application. Basically, you download it on your mobile app, and you can learn any language uh, by playing games. And while it's a, a, a language learning platform, it also serves another purpose for another network at the exact same time. While it's a language learning platform, it's also a crowdsourced text trans translation service. So let me explain. The founder of Duolingo is a man named Luis Von Ahn, and he always asks the question, how could we leverage one network for one reason and solve another problem for a different network at the exact same time by bringing them together? So one problem he saw is that people around the world needed a better way to learn languages for free. So he created this free mobile app where you can play games, say English to French, to learn languages. But the other problem he saw was that news websites around the world needed a quicker way to translate their news website article blogs into different languages. So he brought the problems together. So when players play Duolingo, when you get to, say, the advanced level learning French, you are no longer translating random sentences. You are translating art news website articles of companies like BuzzFeed, CNN, PBS, and beyond. So there's an algorithm where an aggregate amount of people can translate sites around the world. So the third question I want to ask you is, are you truly maximizing the full potential of your networks? If you think about the people and resources that you're a part of, what other problems could they solve when connected in new ways? So I wanted to start with these stories to really have us think about this question of where are we today, right? In our connected world, what these stories have taught us is that it's not just about the individual anymore, and it's not just about the institution. It's about the collective. It's about making anyone in the world accountable. So I want you to think for a minute about what are you accountable for? Your team, your direct reports, your business unit. Now I want you to think about everyone else. How could you leverage anyone else to get the big things done you're trying to achieve? The job of 20th century leaders were those that were able to spread accountability, oftentimes within their team or their business unit. But the job of 21st century leaders will be those that will be able to spread accountability much farther to networks outside their usual suspects, to networks of physicists, patients, doctors, language learners, and far beyond. And so the key question I want to talk about today is how do we spread accountability? How do we enable and maximize the full potential of our networks? Well, the answer is through the power of connectional intelligence. Connectional intelligence is the capability to consistently drive breakthrough innovation and business results by fully harnessing the power of our networks and relationships. We've all heard of IQ as basic knowledge. Fifteen years ago, emotional intelligence came to stage as a key leadership trait for leaders. But in today's world, when we're overconnected, when we're not always in a room with someone to manage their emotions, we can't just rely on what we know or how we manage emotions with them. We need to maximize our connectional intelligence wherever we are at any point in our career.